What if I told you that ancient poets created more vivid images with a few words than many modern fantasy writers with entire sentences? We keep adding layers of detail, hoping to make our worlds feel more real, but often they don't feel more magical than the myths and legends that inspired them. For many years of my fantasy writing journey, I kept running into the same challenge, until I eventually discovered something fascinating in Norse poetry. These storytellers had a way of describing things that didn't just paint pictures. It breathed life into every object, every scene, every moment of their stories. And they did it with an elegance that most of us have forgotten nowadays. So in this video I want to share a completely different way of looking at descriptions. And best of all, it's something so simple you could start using it in your stories right away. Picture this, you're reading a novel where the author never once uses the word sword. Yet their battle scenes are more vivid and powerful than anything you've read before. How is that possible? When I first discovered Norse poetry, I was struck by how they viewed the world through a lens of metaphor. Instead of using simple nouns, they created compound descriptions that revealed the deeper nature of things. These special metaphors are called kennings, and they are one of the most powerful tools I've found for epic fantasy description. When Norse poets needed to describe a ship, they didn't just call it a vessel, they called it a wave horse. Think about that image for a moment here. You instantly see a mighty ship riding the waves like a stallion gallops across the plains. The comparison isn't just poetic, it captures the essence of what a ship does and how it moves. Or take the sun as another example. For them it wasn't just a bright orb in the sky, it was the sky candle, illuminating the world from above. While the sea wasn't just water, it was the whale road, instantly showing both what it is and what travels upon it. These kennings worked because they connected something the audience needed to picture with something they already knew well. But kennings did more than just describe things beautifully, they revealed how people thought about their world. When Norse poets called a sword a womb wolf, they weren't just being creative, they were showing us that in their culture a sword was seen as a predator, a hunter that stalked its prey in battle. This connection between description and cultural understanding is what makes kennings so powerful for fantasy writing. We're not just naming things in our world, we're showing how the people in those worlds think about and understand these things. Look at how this works in modern fantasy. When George R. R. Martin's characters call the wall the world's edge, or Brandon Sanderson describes metals in Mistborn as god metals, they are using this same technique to make their worlds feel deeper and more real. And now that you know what kennings are, let me show you how you can create your own fantasy versions that feel as authentic as the North originals. In my experience, the most effective kennings work because they reflect both function and cultural values. So when I create a kenning, I start by thinking about three key elements. First, they connect something unfamiliar to something familiar. Second, they create an instant clear picture in the reader's mind. And third, they reveal something about how the culture views the object being described. Let me show you how this works with different cultures describing the same object, a sword. A farming community might call a sword a harvest ender, because they see it primarily as something that stops peaceful work and brings violence to their fields. To them, a sword represents the opposite of their daily tools of creation and growth. A warrior society might name that same sword Anna's tongue, because in their culture, swords speak the language of honor and settle disputes. The metaphor tells us here immediately that in this society, combat is seen as a form of communication, a way of speaking truth. A mountain kingdom then might call it Ice Fang because they connect it to the deadly cold of their environment. The name tells us both what the sword does, fights with deadly effect, and it connects it to their daily experience with harsh winter. Do you see how each name creates an immediate picture while also telling us something about the people who use it? That's the power of a well-crafted canning. But what happens when we apply these ancient techniques to something the North never encountered? Like magic. Magic always poses a special challenge in fantasy writing. We're trying to describe something inherently mysterious and otherworldly in a way readers still can grasp. But this is where cannings become incredibly powerful tools. A seafaring people might call magic tight speed because they understand power through their relationship with the ocean. Their spellcasters could become tight singers or wave weavers, showing us that they see magic as something natural, like the forces that move their ship. 
A desert culture, on the other hand, might name magic mirage weaving or call spells dust dreams, revealing their understanding of magic as something that shifts reality like the heat waves above the sand. Their spellcasters could then be called dream walkers or sand speakers. You see how the cultural background informs the compound world we create? Take another example where instead of writing about abstract magical energy, we ground it in natural phenomena our readers understand. Suddenly fire magic becomes star spark because it brings down light from above. But then also notice how different cultures might describe that same fire magic. Desert people might call it sun blood because they understand fire through its relationship to their scorching environment. The mages become sun speakers, walking the line between power and destruction. Our mountain dwellers on the other hand might name it forge breath because they connect magic of fire to their experience with metalworking. Their description tells us they see magic as a craft, something to be shaped and controlled. And coastal people might call it Stormheart, because they associate fire's destructive power with the thunderstorms that threaten their ships. These aren't just fancy names, they are windows into how each culture understands and relates to magic. When you describe magic in your world, you're not just explaining what it does, you're showing how your cultures think about power itself. Now if you found anything useful in the video so far, please consider giving it a like to help me grow the channel. Thank you. Moving on. Throughout the years, I've come across plenty of mistakes with kennings that taught me valuable lessons. But let me share the biggest one I've encountered so you can avoid them in your own writing. The first mistake hit me when I was writing about a desert culture and considered calling their stealthy warriors forest shadows. It sounded poetic, but there was one big problem. These people had never seen a forest. I was so focused on creating an interesting description that I forgot about cultural context. So now I always ask myself, would these people actually make this comparison based on their daily experiences? The second issue I've come across in fantasy writing is overcomplicated canics. Think of a writer describing a magical sword as thunder, lightning, storm, bring a blade. They would be trying to capture every aspect of the weapon's power but the result only feels forced and clumsy. The Norse poets knew better here. They understood that Woundmaker carries more impact than a string of impressive sounding words. Another challenge then comes from being too rigid with structure. While many cannings work beautifully as two word compounds, some of the most memorable ones break this pattern. Remember how George R. R. Martin calls his great ice wall the world's edge? Three words that perfectly capture both what it is and how it feels to those who live in its shadow. Or consider how Terry Pratchett describes his wizard staffs as knob top lengths of unreality. A longer phrase that still works because it instantly tells us both what these objects are and what makes them magical. It's a hallmark of Pratchett's writing style actually. Now the final pitfall then appears when writers start using kennings inconsistently within their cultures. Imagine a story describing a northern tribe's warriors using Frostblade in one chapter, Ice Fang in another and Snow Steel later on. While each phrase might work on its own, the shifting terminology would weaken the sense of a coherent cultural voice. Strong world building with kennings means treating these descriptive phrases almost like part of a culture's vocabulary. The key is creating descriptions that work instantly and feel natural to your world. Start with the most important elements in your story, the things you want readers to remember, and then create clear simple kennings that show both what something is and what it means. Remember, we're not trying to replace every noun with a kenning. We're adding touches of poetic magic to make our most important elements memorable. By learning from the ancient Norse poets, we can create fantasy descriptions that don't just tell readers what things look like, but show them what they mean. And in doing so, we bring our worlds to life with the same magic that made those ancient myths and legends so unforgettable. But having said that, kennings don't work for everything. Sometimes what you need is an actual name for a character or place, one that equally carries deep and powerful meaning within. And for that, watch this video here next where I show you my step-by-step -step method called Essence Name.